Do it right. <laughs> <laughs> we need one of those. And action. <laughs> 357 Productions is proud to present The Masonian, a monthly podcast for Freemasons with the focus of the Grand Jurisdiction of North Carolina. While not an official function of the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, we operate with the full endorsement of Grandmaster Gene Cobb. The opinions expressed on this show are those of the participants and in no way reflect the opinions of the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, its members, or any appendant bodies. We used to say that we didn't own the rights to this music or the license, but now we do, and we can play it any time or however we want to do it. So, he's um, Iron Maiden. We can change it up. We, we can change it up, son. <laughs> Put a little flavor to yeah, it. Yeah, I, I like that. I'm down with some. Hey, we're, yeah, we're gonna make some changes anyway coming up soon. We'll talk. We'll talk about that. That's exactly right. Later. That'll be great. We'll change up the music too. Absolutely, that'd be good. So, uh, so we're excited to have another episode of the Masonian. Um, we're very fortunate tonight. We've got two young Masons. I won't say newly made, um, but they are they are young Masons, and we're we're glad to have them. I'm gonna let them introduce yourself. Yeah. So I was laughing a little bit at the uh, last episode because you were calling us so young. So uh, my name is Patrick Tobin. I'm <laughs> 31, not 26. Uh, member of Excelsior 261. Still pretty young. I mean. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, member of Excelsior 261 over in Charlotte. Uh, was raised up in Terrytown, New York at Solomon's Lodge, number 196. So, And my name is Noah Goon. Uh, I am 26, so you know, I think I still fit the criteria. Um, I was raised at Long Creek 205 on the border of Huntersville and Charlotte, um, although I spent time at Monroe, number 22, in Bloomington, Indiana as well when I was studying at Indiana University. So... Uh, I was in 2014, and then in spring of 2015, I jumped right into the Scottish Rite in the Valley of Charlotte. So, nice. glad to be here. Yeah, I always like to, uh, anytime Long Creek comes up, I like to give a shout out to uh, Mike Harding. Just think Mike's a super good uh, dude. I really like him. Yeah, he's definitely a, a pillar of that lodge and has been an important part of my Masonic career as well. So, always happy to give a shout out to Mike. And Judy. Yeah, oh yeah. she's She is the closest thing to a female uh, Mason in the United States by far, um, and, and according to the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, I, I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna take some issue there and say that Melody McBride and uh, <laughs> um, those, those ladies have are up there. there. They're up there. <laughs> Maybe we should have all them on. Those here. are some fighting words. That though. would Together. be awesome. Yes, this this lady that they're talking about, and Melody and all them, they'd so, be yeah. great. So Melody is uh, uh, Don Kaler's wife, and Don's the uh, I guess the uh, Senior Grand Steward, and he's also the Secretary at Scottish Rite in Greensboro, uh, and Beth, of course. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe I should Mason. say I would love to. Ha- I would love to have all those ladies on one time. The the closest to a female Mason that I've met personally. Let me go on the safe side and say that. Have you ever met any real female Masons? I have not. Yeah, so you know they're co-Masons, mm-hmm. and uh, and actually, uh, we're gonna at Sophia. We're gonna have a lady named Karen Kidd come to a program sometime next year. I've, she's agreed in theory. We just have to get together on scheduling, uh, and she's a co-mason. Now we won't be able to open lodge, um, but we'll just call it a program, just an educational program, uh, no opening or closing. Uh, just get together and listen to her talk about uh, about co-masonry, and uh, she's uh, been published in Heardom several times, and she's written a couple of books. And I'm really excited to to hear her. So speaking of Sophia, this is uh, this is how we wound up with these guys on the show. So they came to visit Sophia, uh, and after lodge, as we all do, we're sitting around, you know, shooting a breeze. Um, you know, we're talking about where they're from and how great y'all enjoyed the experience and how wonderful we were. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and one of you knuckleheads said. You know what y'all ought to do on the podcast is have some young guys on there. Sorry, Guilty and I immediately no. thought he's well, exactly right. I am a young guy. <laughs> what? We're not the young guys. I, that's right. I thought well, no, I'm we're not twenty six. And then I realized, oh, I'm fifty. I just turned fifty, and uh, I said, well, Riley's a young guy, but Riley, you're thirty seven. Thirty seven, and I said, how old are y'all? And I, I guess you told me thirty one. When you said twenty six, <laughs> I have a son that's twenty six. Uh oh. <laughs> so I realized, okay, maybe I'm not, maybe we're not the young guys after all, Riley. The new age Masons. <laughs> <laughs> so in all seriousness, we talk all the time. We talk about, um, uh, you know, where our numbers are going. And, and uh, fortunately in North Carolina, the Grands aren't real caught up on the numbers. They're, they want good Masons, not necessarily numbers of Masons. We're very lucky in that respect here in North Carolina. 
But still, we're always talking about you know what what younger men want, uh, what what they what they expect out of the craft, uh, and what they enjoy and don't enjoy once they get into the craft. And uh, we're always talking about what they might like. And and as and as soon as I started talking to you guys, and and you guys said you ought to have some younger guys on, I thought, well, here's a here's a novel idea. Maybe we'll ask some of the younger guys what it is that they like and what they want and what they expect. So you should have just taken credit for it. I, I, well, I, I usually, by the end of the show, I will somehow uh, have <laughs> come up with uh, taking some way to take credit for it. I always do, right, Riley? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Creatively. Creatively. So uh, so both of you guys were, uh, were raised out of state. No, no. Uh, I was raised in North Carolina. W- at, at Long Creek. At Long Creek, yes, I was made a. And then you went to uh, Indiana to school. Yeah, and then I just took part in the lodge up there. I see. Did you join that lodge? Uh, not on paper, although I sat in the chairs and <laughs> sat on investigation committees. So I you might know, as well. Have, that's right. right. Might as well. Have. I see. So let's start. Let's start with you. Tell tell us about your experience in in New York. All right. So New York was an interesting place for me masonically because. I worked at a tattoo shop up there as the counter guy and just kind of answered calls, helped clients. And some of the guys that used to come in, I would see their rings and, you know, it always kind of piqued my interest. And I had always had this pre-existing interest in masonry through high school, through the stuff I read and just sort of the things that I delved into um, intellectually. And so when I met these guys, I said, man, I really got to, I got to push on this and see, you know, what I can find out. So after bugging them for a couple months, I ended up getting a petition and went through the whole process up there. Um, was entered and passed in New York, and then I actually somehow, it just coincided with about two months before I was supposed to be raised, I ended up moving back to North Carolina and was still working on doing my degrees with Solomons up in New York and ended up having to fly back to be raised uh, like October that year. So... Being raised up there, it was really different coming from that and then coming down to North Carolina. Because in my lodge, the guys all wore tuxedos if they were an officer. Um, What's up, Kat? um, (laughs) You know, everybody uh, was a lot more formal in how they uh, attended the lodge. And the floor work was very strict. The ritual was very just, you know, well rehearsed. It was a totally different experience from when I came down to Charlotte and Matthews and surrounding areas and started traveling around. And I showed up in a tuxedo my first night (laughs) going to visit a lodge after being raised because that's what I thought just was standard. Mm -hmm. And I show up in these guys are in khakis and polo shirts and, you know, looking at me like I'm the odd man out. And, uh, and what did you think? I mean, uh, it was, it was a different experience. So it was, you know, I won't tell you which lodge I was at, because I don't want to speak negatively of anyone. Um, but it was a shock for me. So to come from something that's so strict and so formal, and in my eyes that was very reverent towards the craft, mm-hmm. and then to sort of step down into a totally different jurisdiction and a different way of approaching it into a more relaxed lodge was kind of culture shock in a way. Sure. And so at first it kind of caught me off guard, and I said, well, you know, these guys don't take it as seriously, and it's, you know, it was probably not the white the right way to actually approach that so i saw these guys dressing like this and i was like oh man i I shouldn't really judge them on this because they're just comfortable and they all came from work and this is just sort of how they're you know this is how they do things down here i gotta get used to it and so now i'm used to it i mean i still show up in a suit every day to you know any kind of degree or communication that i go to but yeah it's a totally different experience even from state to state like that so so do you think do, do you think that the way that they did it in New York was better? And that's, 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 okay. that's not a load, that's not, not a loaded question either. I mean, yeah. nobody's going to take offense if you say, um, "Yeah, I think do, it was better." I mean, do, so so let's ask it this way: Do you prefer that way to the to the casualness yes. that we have in North Carolina? Very much so. Why? Um, and you know, I don't know if it's just because it was a thing of comfort for me being raised in a lodge that's more formal and seeing these guys in their tuxedos and sort of approaching it from that vantage point and then coming down and being in these lodges that I felt were a little more relaxed. Um, I definitely preferred the more strict and formal 
adherence to these sort of traditional you know observances um which is why it's for me to go to a lodge like sophia like we did last month or what june i guess it was so um totally different experience and it's yeah it kind of i enjoyed sophia a lot so to go to a traditional because it felt homey or comfortable yeah, it, it felt more like home and it felt more like what i was raised in mm -hmm. uh, so kind of going back to the lodge that i'm at currently while i love it and i love the guys and i'm there a couple days a week you know doing work and hanging out with everybody um there are times i wish it was a little more formal but. so so let me ask you this if can't see be up here in a minute. So, um, so taking your personal experience out of it, the fact that you were raised in a more formal lodge, and now you're in a more casual lodge, a guy that had never experienced one or the other, do you think that most guys of of y'all's age would um, would automatically be more comfortable with the more formal setting? I mean, do you think that they would automatic not more comfortable? Do you think that they would that that would be a better way for everybody to do their business, or or do you? Or, not necessarily, because I and you know I'm not going to steal Noah's thunder because he has a great <laughs> analogy on this, and I'm ab I absolutely love it. So I'll let him convey that in a minute. But you know, you get guys from all walks of life that come to the craft, and they all seek different things. And so, what spoke to me about my lodge initially that I was raised in and the formality and, you know, sort of that reverence that I felt there is not to say that there's not reverence in the lodge that I'm in now, but it's just approached differently. It's a different way of, you know, having your communications. It's a different way of sort of operating your lodge on a day-to-day -day basis and how you put yourself out to the community of, you know, both, I guess, newly initiated Masons and to outsiders as well. So. And when did you come down here? Uh, I only lived in New York for two years, so I was up there 07 to 09, and then came back in 09. You and, came here in 09? Mm -hmm. Wow, so was that the year that we had uh, recognition with Prince Hall? Wasn't that the first full year with recognition? I want to say so, yeah. What would you have done if we didn't have recognition? Did, did, you, did, you, did you know that we were like on the cusp of just getting recognition? No, or? so that actually was entirely foreign to me, and I, I didn't even find yeah. that out until a couple years like probably 2012, 2013, um, because I wasn't as actively involved. You know, I wasn't traveling as much. I traveled to a couple local lodges where I was living, but because I was in school, I was working, you know, I couldn't always make it out to meetings. So if I did, it was just whichever one was down the street, and it was every two, three months maybe. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't as actively involved. I had no clue about the, you know, the disconnect between Prince Hall and the... Would it have been important to you if, if we had not, if we didn't have recognition? Um, I think so. I'm, and I think it's just because my lodge up there was integrated. Mm -hmm. So I was very used to that. And then, you know, there's lodges where I've been to down here and there's guys who still to this day won't allow it to happen right. just within their lodge. And to me, that's a little foreign. Let's ask it this way. If, if you, instead of moving to North Carolina, if you'd moved to one of the states that did not have recognition and you found out that they didn't have recognition, I mean, would that be a deal breaker for you? Or would you just assume that's just the way it is? You know, that's a tough question. Um, I almost feel like it would be a deal breaker for me. And it's just because of how I operate in my outside life, outside of the craft, that I would approach that mindset or view that mindset as being sort of antithetical to, you know, the brotherly love and universal brotherhood of masonry. Do you think most millennials feel that way? I mean, uh, speak, speak for a whole generation here. By all yeah. Means. Jeez. Put me on the spot. Why don't you? Um, I mean, I find the, the younger generations to be much more tolerant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I, I definitely and think so. To, and to I definitely think it's moving. That it would be a deal breaker mm -hmm. for, for many of them. It's, I mean, it's really interesting because he and I came in at the same time. Um, yeah. If you remember, that's right when I came in. Yeah, that's right. Because I had all the Prince Hall guys that were wanting to come, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that was something yeah. that I, I I went through the same exact thing you did. I had numerous numerous friends that were Masons, but I probably had more friends that were Prince Hall, and they were always talking to me about it, and and they wanted to come and and be a part of that, and and then um, that was all explained to me, which had just changed yeah. right when you and I were raised. And it, I mean, I just had no clue. I was just like, really? I mean, 
what do you mean there's two? <laughs> yeah, because I mean yeah. we're segregated. I, and it was, because you know, it just forget. wasn't spoken about up there. Because like, It was I, a totally I, different world. It, I never knew the distinguish. You know, there was some sort of difference between Prince Hall masonry and just what I consider regular masonry. It was just never spoken about. Mm-hmm. And, and I had a hard time with it. Um, and if it weren't for Ben, I, I don't know what I would have done, but I had a great coach. Yeah. And, and he explained it to me, you know, and I mean, um, you know, I said, I, I don't understand, Ben. I mean, I, I just went through learning all this stuff that, you know, we love everybody. Mm. But wait, there's two groups. As long as they're yeah. white. Yeah, there. But wait, we've got two groups. We've yeah. got. That, how, and how does that you work? You know, that's that's what kind of threw like threw me off in your question because I was when I was coming up and everything, and I had you know amazing coaches. This guy named David and uh, Carter, both just phenomenal coaches. So if you guys watch this, you guys are amazing. Um, who so I was there, yeah, you know, I was there a couple days a week with these guys, and so they really went outside of just teaching me stuff in between degrees to really just educating me on masonry as a whole. Good for them. Good. You know, and it, it was the background of, well, here's lodge etiquette and here's, you know, stories about me coming up as a Mason and here's ways to sort of examine yourself morally and how you should begin to make changes in yourself as a man and, you know, really apply the craft to your life. Good. So good for them. Well, we're going to get there on this Prince Hall thing. we we got a few more states to go. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, um, but it's inevitable. It's going to happen. They're just being stubborn. So, Noah's 26. He'll see it in his lifetime. Oh, yeah, that's right. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too, brother. Yeah. Noah, let's talk about you a little bit. So you are uh, racing in Long Creek. Yeah, raising Long Creek. Yeah, and then you went off to school, uh, history major, that's you right. tell me. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I had been a member for about um, – not even a full year before I moved. So I've probably spent more time in an Indiana Blue Lodge than I have in a North Carolina one, although North Carolina lodges still feel like the way it should be, right? Because it's what I, what I learned. Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so you did both your undergrad and your, your master's is in history? Yes. And, and I understand we have a new job. Would you like to uh, yeah, brag I, about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, I'm... It's starting next month. I'll be an adjunct lecturer at a you know relatively large community college in the Charlotte area. So, I'll be teaching history to the the young folks and some of the continuing education folks. So, hopefully, this st- hopefully the young people think I'm older, and uh, hopefully the older people think I'm older too, so they don't think I'm some 26 year old uh, <laughs> telling them how to study. You gotta get like a Harris tweed coat, and uh, you yeah, know, get the uh, the yeah, elbow the, pads. Yes, it's yes. Supposed to get a corn cob pipe. It'll be there good. You go. So we had a pretty interesting uh, talk about history before the show started, and uh, I, th- I think we're going to get you to come do a program at Sophia. Oh, so, uh, so everybody listening can uh, put that on their schedule. We'll try to announce it. Remind me to announce it once we get that scheduled. All right. So you're you're the youngest one here. Tell us uh, what made you get into Freemasonry, and what were you expecting to find, and did you find it? So I am either the sixth or the seventh generation in my family. Uh, one so of those, huh? yeah, one of those. <laughs> and but it wasn't like lodge was a big thing. I mean, my my father wasn't raised until the mid two thousands. So I knew that his father was, and I'd always seen his ring. But then you know when my dad joined, and I saw what he did, and especially when he joined the Scottish Rite, and he's like, hey, going to Greensboro for a weekend. Can't tell you what I'm doing. And he came back and he had that patent, right? And any of you guys that are in Scottish Rite know that thing looks cool, mm-hmm. right? It's got Latin on it. It's got hieroglyphs. It looks awesome. And uh, I was mm-hmm. like, well, what's that? And what's that? And he was one of those guys like, I don't know. I can't tell you, right? So um, the mystery of it really pulled me in. And, you know, I had a pretty wild youth, right? My, my teen years were, uh, you know, a nice blueprint of what not to do. And, you know... When I started making some changes in my life and kind of, you know, straightened up, I started to find myself kind of disconnected from my peers morally, right? Uh, You know, I stopped drinking, wasn't partying. Um, Not to say that I don't like to have a good time, but those things for me present certain challenges, right? And I started looking around and I didn't know a whole lot of people my age that were interested in actively bettering themselves. And so once I did, uh, once I did come to a lodge, and, and the idea of self improvement became uh, highlighted to me, I knew that I had sort of found a place that I could fit. Um, you know, and I also had uh, a great coach, 
uh, brother uh, Brody over at Long Creek, you know, it was the same thing. It was like, well, here's what we're doing as far as the ritual goes, but here's what some of these things mean, can mean in your life. And uh, at that point, I started to realize that this was bigger than just a fraternal organization. Because for me, the fraternity was never what attracted me personally. Um, for me, it was the, the esotericism, the hidden knowledge, right? Um, the philosophical aspects of it that really pulled me in. And I could definitely say that I, I was not disappointed. Um, but I also had the initiative to look and to ask questions. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to, to answer um, the question that you asked to Patrick about whether or not I, I would want tuxes at my lodge, you know, Long Creek is situated... Um, on the border of Huntersville and Charlotte in one of the last like rural bastions of Charlotte, right? Mm -hmm. You've got North Lake and the mall that creep up to it, but there are guys in my lodge that have lived on the same road for 75 years. And so it's cool because in addition to the guys that are natives, you also have a lot of transplants. Uh, you got guys like Mike Harding that are really, um, you know, well-versed in what we're doing, you know, in a lodge and, um, you know, into, into the slightly more philosophical stuff. But at the same time, you know, you've got guys that are really interested in having a group of guys that they can go and be brothers with and improve themselves in a, you know, moral way. And so for me, if, I don't know, when the first time I went to Sophia, I said, wow, I remember saying this is what masonry should be. I remember that's what I said. Um, but I think about the brothers at my lodge, some of them that would never have come if that were the case, right? Or, or some of the young guys that I know coming through now that are interested in a fraternity that isn't based around partying, right? Um, that are interested in, you know, living a moral life, but maybe aren't so interested in the philosophical aspects. And I think, um, you know, I'm glad that masonry can mean different things to different people. I think that's one of its strengths. Yeah, that's a great answer. So what you're saying is there's no magic bullet here to uh, to 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 capture in the millennials. You've just got to offer a little bit of everything. Well, I think we were talking about this on the way up here. I think for me, what pulled me in, and I've had a couple of friends that since I was, was raised, they petitioned and joined, was the mystique of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's something cool about approaching an organization that is, you know, private in many aspects. Mm. And... Um, you know, coming from Indiana, or after spending time up there, their um, Grand Lodge, from my understanding, was very concerned with getting numbers up. And so they have one-day classes on a regular basis. Um, they have the, the way that they do the coaching is a bit different in the sense that it's basically, it's based, proficiency is based on the coach's word, not necessarily standing proficient before a lodge. Hmm. Um, and so they've made it a lot easier to join. To, to, to make it simple, and yet their numbers are still dropping. And so for me, I enjoyed the sort of effort that I had to put forth to go, you know, me personally. Um, but I don't know, you know, I think that, I also think that just as you have so many different types of men joining the lodge um, in previous generations, right, from different walks of life, different interests, you know, my generation's no different in the sense that there are guys that are there for different reasons. You know, we talked about one episode, I think it was last episode, the idea of maybe doing a little more placement with a guy that wants to join a lodge. So maybe ask him what his interests are, and if he's looking for that esoteric stuff and send him to a T.O. Lodge or a Mosaic or something, if he's interested in um, you know, being where his family's at, send him to that one. If he's interested in fundraising or, or uh, you know, hanging out with some good old yeah, boys, then absolutely. send him to a good old boy lodge. Mm -hmm. So we talked about that. We we talked about almost doing almost like the college 101, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. where you go in, you take the, the uh, you know, the exam, the interest exam, saying, you know, where do my interests fall? What am I looking for? Where will I excel? And then point them in that direction. Yeah. Like a Masonic aptitude test. Exactly. Yeah. Figure exactly out where they're, gonna, they're really going to shine. In Just like a college direction. offers. We're, we're, yeah. You know, if you go in and you don't know what, you know, we offer it at the community college system. You come in, you take the aptitude test, find out where your interests lie and where you would best be suited. Yeah. Um, hmm. We could do the same thing Masonically. We, we certainly, 
may retain more guys because you know you can have a guy that be a great mason, but if you put him in the wrong lodge right off the bat, where if he went to this lodge down the street that was more in line with his interest, maybe that would keep us some of them from drifting off from us. Yeah, and, and, we, and we deal them. with the same thing you guys are dealing with. I mean, I, I did, I, and we've talked about it numerous times on the show. Um, I love our Blue Lodge. Um, I, I love I love the guys there. They're great. I've learned so much there. But I, I remember after a while of going through it, you know, I, I came to Ben and, and I said, you know, I just I, I kind of expected something different, you know, something a little deeper, richer than, than kind of what I'm getting. Not that I'm saying that there's anything wrong with what's going on there. And it was like, there, there's a whole other side. Mm-hmm. There, there, there's a whole other side. Just just be patient. And, um, and luckily, I, again, I, I, I brag on Ben a lot for being a good coach and he was also a coach to Sean, and we're, we're very fortunate to have had him. But, you know, he, he exposed us Don't to that. Don't stop it. <laughs> I, I was, but he exposed Don't us to that. Stop. And literally, we, we, I, I, I go in, and, and there's several things that he brought me into. And, um, you know, and, and I, I'm not trying to speak for Sean back here, but when, when, I, when I walked into it and we got into these things, I was like, yes, this is what I was looking for. Um, and it, it worked. And the way it was explained to me, because, you know, the majority of guys at Long Creek are, you know, Blue collar guys that, you know, might be real interested in the ritual, but not real interested in what's behind the ritual. Uh, you know, the, the metaphor that, that Patrick was trying to give me credit for is actually a friend of mine over at the Scottish Rite uh, Research Club in Charlotte, who, at the risk of sounding elitist, I will leave him nameless. Um, but, you know, he was saying that uh, masonry is a lot like, I think he said, a, a milk stool, if you were milking a cow. Oh, I know this guy. Yeah, yeah, you know me. <laughs> and so yeah. that each leg... You know, a three-leg stool is necessary for the, the, in order for the stool to, to serve a purpose. And that in masonry, you know, you might have some guys that are interested in just the fraternity, right? And that's one leg. And, and they're necessary and they're great guys. And they mm. are, in a lot of times, the heartbeat of a lodge. Then you got guys that are, are really into learning the lectures, learning the ritual. Um, once again, very necessary, very crucial, and they get a lot out of it. But then you got guys that are really into what's underlying the entire system of masonry. And, uh, you know, once again, every one of every lodge I've ever been to has one of those guys, right. That you just know, maybe he's like real weird, kind of spooky. Who knows? Maybe he's real popular, you know, like, like those are my kind of people. But, uh, yeah, (laughs) but that, that in order for Freemasonry to perform as it is, you need all three of those. And I think that's a really good way to look at it because for me, um, even though the reason that I'm so, um, the reason that masonry is so big in my life and that I've devoted so much of my time to it is because I saw the other side of it, right? I saw the deeper meaning. Uh, I was introduced to it by men at my lodge. And um, that being said, I can't devalue what another brother who has no interest in learning what the ritual means, what he gets out of it. I can't devalue that, you know, because for him, it might mean something completely different, but be equally impactful in his life. And so... Um, I don't know. You know, I, I think that um, it takes all different types of masons in order to make this thing work. Yeah, it certainly does at the size that we are. You want to add anything to that? No, I mean, literally, he hit the nail on the head when we were driving back from Sophia last time. That was we literally had this conversation for about an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so I, I'll let you answer this one at a time. If if you were made grandmaster tomorrow. <laughs> What would you change about the way that we do business? I got to be honest. I don't know if there's anything that I would change. It's perfect. No, it's not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to keep my dues card, y'all. Uh, um, you. Yeah. So I really don't think that there was there's anything that stands out to me that I would change. But it's mainly because looking at it from the same mindset that Noah has, where you kind of have to draw from all these different vantage points to really appreciate masonry as a whole, um, that you do need these kind of guys who just love to come and cook breakfast, you know, for a Saturday degree or the guys who show up early to cook dinner. And then you have the guys who have memorized everything and are the certified lecturers and the guys Mm -hmm. who do education in their lodge. And then you got the guys out there weeding and, you know, planting flowers and stuff like that. I think you kind of need all of it. Like Noah said, and changing anything in the way that things currently are, mm-hmm. I feel like you might kind of push some of those away. You know, I don't know exactly who you would push away. Um, 
but I guarantee you that those that are coming now all take something different home with them. And I think, I mean, honestly, I don't think North Carolina Masonry is doing too badly with numbers right now. I think we're, yeah, we're okay. we've got a lot of good, healthy, thriving lodges. So. Well, we got some, we got some, we got some that are in trouble too, but I mean, yeah. but, it, but we've got all kinds, just like you got all kinds of Masons, you got all kinds of lodges, oh. right? Yeah. What are you going to change? Well, I want to start by saying I'm really glad you answered first uh, so I could form it in mind. Seriously, um, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I guess I could have given you a heads up on that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I think, um, you know, for me, if, if in a perfect world, right, where it could just be done, I would really like to see um, like a, a regular sort of inspection of ritual, right? I think that that needs to be done right. But that being said, um, you know, we're talking about the Masonic aptitude test, for lack of a better term, or, or redirection. That's going to, you know, when one lodge starts getting a whole lot of people, that's going to ruffle some feathers, right? That sort of thing. And, and the same with, uh, you know, inspecting ritual or something and, and ritualists that, you know, would alienate some people. And I know I've only been a Mason for a few years, right? So I've never sat in the East, but those that I, I've, my, my friends that have, that I've had candid conversations with, I see what they have to juggle to keep everyone happy, right? Or to, well... To not piss anybody off, really, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's tough to do when you want things done right. But that being said, I do think that there is, like, there's a minimum level of, of sort of conduct with ritual that needs to be had. And we have the lodges of instruction, right? We have systems in place to sort of regulate this. But, you know, um, I think that if the ritual is compromised, we lose a lot of what we're doing. So you think that the DDGLs should like make a surprise inspection visit? Is that what we're talking about? Well, you know, uh, saying that now, the one day that I'll maybe sit in the East during a ritual, somebody will call out sick. There are things that happen, right? People right. have to fill in on lectures they don't know that well. Um, sometimes they need a prompter. Those things are okay, you know. But I also think that, um, you know, I think that sometimes it, it gets put on the back burner in favor of, doing things that are, are necessary, right? Charity fundraisers, um, you know, building fundraisers, things that are needed to keep some of the other wheels moving in the lodge. But, um, you know, once again, for me, the ritual is at the heart of it for me. Right. And that might not be for other brothers, but for me, it definitely is. And so that would be the only thing that I would, you know, wave my magic wand and, and change. But, um, that being said, I will say coming back here, um, after being away for two years, I missed it here. You know, North Carolina has great lodges. Yes. We've got great w ritual and not to malign Indiana Freemasonry because it's, it's, you know, it's, I had a wonderful time there, my excellent brothers, and it was a key part of my life up there. But I think if I were made a Mason in Indiana and would have joined the Northern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite, mm. my involvement in Freemasonry would probably be a lot less. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I'm sure that the, the grands will be very happy to hear that assessment. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, just to kind of jump on what Noah said, I, I do kind of agree that maybe we do need to keep rituals sort of in the forefront of, you know, the focus on making sure that it is done very well. Um, and it's funny that you suggest, you know, Grand Lodge guys kind of surprising everyone and keeping an eye on things because that actually did happen at my lodge in new york really quite regularly because we were only about 15 20 minutes from the grand lodge <laughs> so they would just so we regularly in. had you know guys come hang out for a, a stated or something or for a degree yeah and i mean it was military precise those guys were on point your your right angles were right angles Really, you know, there was there was no uh, diagonals cut. So yeah, well, there's yeah, you know, we cut a lot of corners down here. Sometimes some lodges do, some don't. I visit an awful lot of lodges. Um, you know, like you say, sometimes your guy needs a prompt. I mean, it just it happens, right? But it's disheartening when you go in a lodge. When you go in a lodge in February and the, and their opening's not very good, you can kind of. I mean, there's no excuse for that, but you can give them somewhat of a pass. They've just they're new officers. They're in new chairs. When you go in that same lodge and may and they still can't open and close right they got a problem mm -hmm. and, and and we just had seem to have no um nobody goes in there and fixes the problem they they just let them flounder around and well you know, and i at least the bad part of that too is you do have guys who maybe see that error and 
you know, step up and say something about it within the lodge. And they're kind of viewed, especially if they're an older gentleman, viewed as being crotchety and sort of, you know. Grumpy old past master. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, whatever. He's just, you know, he's grumpy. We're fine. That ritual looked looked okay. We're good. Or an arrogant young buck, right? Yes. Being, being a newer guy in the room. And yeah. I learned real quickly, like, yeah, don't call people out and stuff like that. There's a fraternal way to go about this. Volunteer to learn the ritual yourself, for instance. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it can happen the other way where if a new guy says, well, wait a minute, you know, mm, that was kind of off and we kind of skipped a part of that, you know, it can be like, hey, well, wait a minute, when were you in the chairs? And, yeah. I, and I've not had that experience at my lodge. I've been very fortunate, but I can, I've seen those sort of tensions arise as well. Yeah, it's definitely happened. I mean, there's there's stuff I've seen and I've kind of wanted to say things. And it's definitely, I can't call somebody out directly, just like you said, because there is that sort of stigma of, well, I haven't been in that long. You know, I, I can't really say anything to these guys and be Your respected. Seniority. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know, that seniority that comes with decades of commitment to the craft and working the ritual and stuff that maybe it is just an off day for them or maybe it's something that, you know, happened where maybe they did flub a, a couple lines in a, a charge or something. So, I mean, or you could be like Bean and just call them out. I mean, just... <laughs> yeah, everybody loves that. <laughs> I just, I can't, I, I can't, I don't mind seeing anybody mess up. I hate seeing people mess up because they didn't give a crap. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't care enough to learn it. I hate it when we say, well, eh, it's good enough. But he'll be, you know, he'll be a fellow craft when he leaves here tonight. I, I, I can't stand that. It just, it, it goes to, uh, uh, to not taking any pride in what you're doing, and so then you devalue it. Yeah. Well, and my experience in Freemasonry has been that I get out of it what I put into it, right? Um, you know, the the Scottish Rite is such a big part of my Masonic experience. I tell everyone, like, listen, no, you, when they're raised, I know you don't want to add another set of dues, but when you do and you want more, this is where you go. But even joining that, if I weren't really looking into, you know, degrees, if I weren't looking into what's behind all of this, I would get a a lot less out of it. And so I think when we're coaching a new guy and he bumbles through the catechism and doesn't really know it, the message that we're sending is, yeah, that's good enough. You're getting everything that you can out of it. But by learning mine when I was going through, and I went through alone, I didn't have anybody else in my, my degrees, I've learned some things about those degrees, right? That I think had I been, you know, just passed through just because everybody showed up that night, um, that, you know, maybe I would have not noticed about. Um, But at the same time, if we're bringing out everybody for a fellow craft degree and we get everybody to show up and they know their parts and we want to examine them that night, right? We're really going to send all those guys home because the guy forgot a couple of words. And so I understand, Mm -hmm. right? I get it, but... Maybe examine them at a state of meeting, and then, you know, if they learn it, they can do it. So just out of curiosity, I want to throw this out there while we're talking about opening. In the proposal for the Grand Lodge um, this year is opening on the first degree. Mm-hmm. Well, what are your thoughts, both of your thoughts, about opening on the first? Do you think that's going to keep people in? Would it, would it keep a, a new Mason in, especially a, a, a younger Mason that's coming in? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? So the proposal is to open on the first and then conduct business on the first. Yes. Yes. I, the, the, to have the option to do that, trying to involve the entered apprentices instead of just telling them go away until you're raised. Personally, I think it's a terrible idea. Why? Um, and, and kind of harkens back to what Noah was talking about a few minutes ago, where you sort of take that pride in learning your catechism and you know putting in this work. I never would have dreamed of sitting in lodge. Um, until I was raised. And for me, that was kind of the goal, was to really put in the work and put in the effort and prove myself worthy of sitting with those brothers who I respected and who I looked up to that were mentoring me through this whole process. So while it's great to maybe have a degree and have them come and sit on a degree for, you know, say they're a fellow craft and they want to go watch a first degree, I think that's great. And I think it's, it's been done plenty of times. You know, we do it at my lodge. Um, I don't know about conducting business, though. So the lodge I was a part of in Indiana did conduct business on the lowest degree present. So if there was an entered apprentice that showed up for dinner and he was there for the stated, we'd open on the first degree. And it's a double-edged sword, and I'll tell you why. 
it was hard for me because after about you know six or nine months there, I started doing education at every stated meeting for the lodge. Hmm. And if you prepare something that's like third degree stuff, mm -hmm. and an inner apprentice shows up, well, you don't really have any education that night. Mm -hmm. You keep one, you keep one there just in case, right? Yeah. Some some basic stuff, but um. It's cool. Well, one, it's cool because the, the officers really learn the parts for all three degrees, the opening, because mm -hmm. you have to do it on the spot, maybe. Um, but I also think, like, I, I remember, you know, I, I agree with Patrick in a sense that when I was new and I would come, I would come, I came for every dinner after my EA. I came for every dinner, um, regardless if it was a degree that I could go to or a state of being I could go to. I just showed up. And that was, it gave me something to aspire to, like you said. But I think, because a lot of lodges, right? My father always complains that, you know, a lodge that he used to go to, their state of meetings consisted of pay the bills, honor the veterans, who, mm -hmm. who's sick, all right, let's go home, and let's read the minutes for 20 minutes. Um, that would be another thing I would change if I were a grandmaster. Oh, you can, yeah, yeah pre-approved minutes. But anyway, um, <laughs> that if you're new, if, if I'm an apprentice and I've just gone through this wonderful degree, and I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is the hottest thing on the block, and then I go, and my lodge may not really be up on education, may not really be up on any presentations. They're just talking about getting the roof fixed, the widow's home. I might be like, well, really, what am I doing here? You know, am I just joining Rotary Club? You're saying that you're afraid they may find out how bad we suck. <laughs> Exactly. Well, you know, it's like <laughs> so much. You got to save that to the third degree at least. That's right. Well, you know, and I and I do <laughs> yeah. think that um, I do think that there's something to that because you know after I was raised, I saw the bigger picture, right? And I realized that yes, as lodges, we are little organizations that need to be administered, right? There there are administrative things that need to happen. And because I am a master mason, I get to be a part of that, and I get to vote, and I get to have my voice heard. But if I was an entered apprentice walking in, I don't really know if I would just say, oh, wow, wow, this really is the Rotary Club. Because that was what I was always afraid of. And I was very glad to find out that it was nothing against Rotary. If there's any uh, brothers watching that are members of, of the Rotary Club, I don't mean to malign the Rotary Club. Send all the hate mail, too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Patrick Tobin. Um, but, you know... <laughs> I, that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for something, um, you know, more than that. And uh, so, I don't know. I didn't see anything bad come of it when I was in Indiana. But thinking about had I gone through and been able to come in, I might have second-guessed whether or not I wanted to go all the way with it. So we lose you – know, we, we talk a lot on the show about the fact that the last number I heard was 26% of our internet apprentices never make it uh, to being raised. Why do you all think that is? they realize that we don't have the Templar gold or the Declaration of Independence. They realize that National Treasure was not a documentary about Freemasonry and they dip out maybe. But, you know, who knows? I mean, I think that some people might be attracted to Masonry for the wrong reasons. I think that that definitely can happen. Um, and they come in and they go through the first degree and they think, this isn't for me. Um, other times, maybe they were joining for business interests. Right. I don't know. I, because I haven't seen all that happen in a situation where I could put the blame on the lodge or the way it was done. In my experience, I would have to assume that it was some change of heart on the candidates part. You know, I don't know what we could do in order to keep that simply because I was so excited when I joined. I didn't care that I couldn't come to the state of meetings. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to come to the dinners and meet more people, you know. Patrick, what do you think? Why do you think we lose so many guys? I, I got to second that. I genuinely think that a lot of these young guys that come in, or you know, guys of any age really, um, but if we're focusing specifically on millennial age or younger, so guys that come in and get their first degree, I've been on this kick lately where I keep getting pre-petition candidates, and so I get to befriend them and introduce them to lodge life and you know, kind of work with them through the whole process. And so a lot of these guys that come in have so many other things going on, whether it's, you know, a relationship or they're in school. Like I was doing my undergrad when I came into masonry and, you know, was in grad school for a portion of it. So I had that to worry about. A lot of people are working full-time full -time jobs now. So it's like you have all these other things on your plate in addition to trying to squeeze in time to go to lodge and go do coaching and stuff like that. 
So if you have all those things and maybe you did join it for the wrong reasons and you sought out social advancement or some sort of, you know, less than savory benefits from masonry and you realize, okay, well, I've got to go study catechism a couple times a week. Hmm. It's probably not the most appealing thing. Um, so once we get a guy raised, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that especially millennials these days, the family units are tighter than they ever were. Your parents, and especially your grandparents, the men went and did things with men, and the women did things with, with other women. But they didn't do near as much together as we do today. Today, everybody goes to their kids' soccer games and as a family, a unit, right? I wonder, just because people are so busy and don't have time to go to Lodge, you guys, you guys are the wrong guys to ask this question, I guess, because y'all do go. But I wonder if there's a, something that we could do as Freemasons, some way that we could have an outreach program to those guys, or some way that we could give them something to get out of Masonry without them actually having to physically show up well, at, at the door. And so actually I'm not, Probably not a horrible good. person to ask about this because when I moved back from New York in 2009, there was a good period of time where I didn't attend lodge because I literally never got to sit with the guys in my lodge in New York outside of degrees. Um, I flew back up for my, you know, my raising. That was it. When I came back, I just traveled to lodges around the area when I could. But because I was working and I was in school, I didn't have the chance to really go to meetings for quite a while. Um, it's only been the last couple years that I would say I've really been able to delve into it like I want to which is part of the reason why I held off on Scottish Rite. So I was raised in 09. I'm literally just now going through in the fall, hopefully. So Scottish Rite. Yeah. So for me, one of the things that I... You'll love it. Yeah. One of the, I'm, it's the one thing, literally. I was the you, guy... You'll do it in Greensboro. Yeah. yeah so I was coming to Greensboro. Mm -hmm. so. I was the guy who hadn't even gotten his first degree yet, and I was reading Morals and Dogma. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, had this book collection that kept growing and growing. And was reading it and thinking, oh, man, this is brilliant. This is great. I don't understand any of this. I have no idea what's going on. And it was because I hadn't been through the degrees to get that foundation of knowledge that I needed. But for me, the one thing that really helped me, being in that situation where I couldn't regularly attend state of communications or degree work or anything, and maybe not even correspond with brothers on a regular basis outside of my, you know, my coaches from New York, was the Grand Lodge of New York had a reading course. So I was doing the reading mm. course where... Really? Yeah. So it's the, I want to say it's like the Livingston, Chancellor Livingston Library or something. Um, and they had 20 or so reading courses, three or four books a piece. And when you got done with the whole course, they sent you a certificate saying, good job, you finished it. Really? And, you know, my lodge especially would call you out and put a little thing in the, the month's trestle board and say, you know, congrats to Patrick for finishing this this reading course. So, so would they have like a couple of books on history and a couple of books on esoteric yeah. stuff and a couple of books yeah, on... Yeah, it was geared around different lodge subjects. Management so you had... And, yeah, and you kind of worked through it. So you had your entered apprentice stuff and you had, yeah. you know, historical aspects of the lodge. You had a section on, uh, you know, just first degree symbolism, second degree symbolism, third degree. You had... Everything was kind of allocated to exactly what point you were in sort of your Masonic career. And it, I mean, it's the coolest thing. I'm not sure if North Carolina does it or not. No, we don't. But I would, I would love to start something like and that. See, and I would think because of the age difference, you know, a lot of, I, I, I'm not your age, I'm a little older, but still in the same mindset, I did what you guys did, did my undergrad and <clears throat> got my graduate degree, but I was just in that mode, you know, and you know, you guys know that mode, just getting out of it. You're just in that mode, you just want to keep going. So like, now I want to go ahead and do my doctoral. But if we structured what you're talking about almost like an educational layout for a college or a university, for those guys that, like you guys, were in that mode but you can't attend, it's just it's just like another part of coursework. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm, I'm already in this mode. Why well, don't just read these books? Yeah. I'm already doing I all mean, this other stuff. I think that's a phenomenal idea. I would love to do that. Even now, I would still participate in that if it was something that was going on. And then just, just different levels. So, like, you know, you come up with different names, but it'd be like – an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, <laughs> master's, doctoral. Maybe the education committee will do something with that next year. Be cool. Whoever's in charge. Next but I, year. and I also like what we were talking about earlier about that that um, that placement exam. So I, and I think that'd be something really neat as far as like it too. the purposes. You once you raise a, a brother, 
he takes that 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 placement test. And in that way, because a lot of guys, just like when I came in, I just, I mean, I didn't know what all was out there. And, and again, I was reaching out to Ben because I thought, you know, there's, there's got to be a little something more to this. Then you're explaining to them in an educational setting, going back to education, here's a placement test and here's all the different areas of masonry. Now, you've not learned about them, but this is what they all focus in. Mm-hmm. And maybe this is where you would like to go. So you need like a core of guys that are like guidance counselors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you call that guy up and he says, okay, what do you want? Yeah, yeah an advisor. You need, you need yeah. an advisor. Yeah. Well, I think um, it's a responsibility of, of, like, okay, for myself, when I see a brother coming up through the degrees that is of a similar mind in the sense that they want to know these things, I take the time to set, sit aside with them and say, hey, listen, there's more to this if yes. you want to know. Yeah. Come talk to me afterwards, and I'll point you to where people point at me. And I was very fortunate to have one of those guys in my lodge. Hmm. And now I try to be that guy in any lodge yes. that I'm going to. Um, yeah. but, I, I talk about it all the time. And, and, I, I, think and, 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 and I call them the knowers. So, yeah. so they're, you know, they're guys that just know that particular aspect of it, and, and they know to go put their arm around a guy that's asking those questions and say, hey, come here, let's have a talk. Yeah. Read Absolutely. this book. Meet this guy. And, and like the knowers and like you, you, you're seeing this guy and you're putting your arm around him and saying, hey, this is, there's more. I mean, this test could be huge for retention. Mm-hmm. I mean, because if guys don't know, they, I mean, they're, they're more likely to say, this is just really not what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. And get out without even knowing that there was something that they were looking for. How about if we had guys that knew that there were motorcycle lodges? Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't do, my understanding is they don't do degree work. The motorcycle lodges don't. I mean, it's just not their thing. They can do it. They just, you know, they, they pretty much want to be a second lodge to people. Yeah. But how many, how many motorcycle guys would like to be Masons, but they don't, they don't know that they can do both, marry yeah. those two things I, up? I went to a degree a couple of weeks ago over at Steel Creek. And being a visitor, you know, you stand up and introduce yourself. And one of the questions was, state your name, you know, what lodge you're from, and what kind of motorcycle you ride from. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, literally, I, I couldn't believe it. Every guy in the room pretty much had something to say about it. So. Nice of Solomon must have showed up that night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, in all this for me, you know, if you look at masonry in a broader context of, of the type of tradition, right, initiatic tradition, so much of the importance and I think the, the meaning behind that is based on the individual's willingness to ask what more is there. Yeah. And... You know, I have to wonder how much of that will be lost if it's just f- not foisted upon you. But you know what I mean? If it's made so apparent. Because yeah. for me, one of the reasons yeah, it, gotta, was so, it was yeah. so impactful was it was like I, I asked the hard. right people yeah. and I went to the right places. And it's like, this is great because, you know, I sought it out. Um, but I also agree that like if I was raised in a different lodge, I may have never seen this side of masonry. Right. And, and that's and a shame. That, yeah, and that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. So if you join my lodge or your lodge, apparently, mm-hmm. and, and a guy starts asking those questions, then some then we're going to guide him in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But there's a ton of lodges that don't have that mm-hmm. guy. And, and so the guys that he would be asking, A, don't pick up on uh, some a lot of the kind of nonverbal or, or, or uh, shaded mm-hmm. questions that he's asking because usually guys don't come right out and say, hey, I want to talk about, you know, mm-hmm. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they, they don't really pick up on what he's trying to ask because a lot of times those guys don't even know what they're trying to ask. They know what they're looking for. They don't know how to describe mm-hmm. it, right? Uh, and and the, they're ashamed to say, I, I don't know anything about the deeper, more philosophical parts of the craft. I just know what I was taught, which is here's how we, you know, here's the words we say and here's the motions that we use. Um, and those are the guys that a lot of times drift off because it was like that for me when I started asking him in my lodge. Now there's a bunch of guys that, that are kind of knowers down there. But um, but but initially, I, I like to have never found those guys. I had to scour the Internet and, you know, ask 10,000 people and finally got started to get guided in the right direction. But uh, but a lot of the guys just kind of drift off. You're right, it's got to be hard. It's, it's got to be – you don't want it to be easy. Yeah, it's I, – I think you really do have to walk But it doesn't need to be impossible. It. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I got lucky coming into the lodge I'm in now because I kind of found a pocket of guys who are very similar in mindset, mm-hmm. who spend their spare time reading the Kabbalion and 
various esoteric texts and then we come into lodge and we all kind of have that identifying thing in us that that search for that little bit extra that we know is there that maybe we're not getting in just an everyday regular stated yeah i, I like excelsior I, excelsior has a feel when you walk in it's just mm -hmm. a very electric group mm -hmm. i mean you have people of color you have people of different religious backgrounds mm -hmm. okay. uh, you, you know you you have young guys and old guys it's just a, a lot of lodges you walk in and everybody's co cookie cutter kind of yeah. people right yeah, but not y'all's lodge and that's lodge is one very of the diverse. biggest draws for me was yeah. literally I walked in and I said, you know what? There's guys here that are covered in tattoos. Yeah, That makes me feel more comfortable. There's guys of all walks of life, all ages, all religious backgrounds, all ethnic backgrounds. Like, this is pretty great. I remember hearing when I was new that, hey, Excelsior opens with the Bible, the Tanakh, and the Quran on the mm -hmm. altar. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I wish I saw that more. Um, you know, for me, uh, I think that it's been it's my understanding and i've only been a mason for a few years so i can't say for sure but it's my understanding that traditionally it was pointed to the appendant bodies hey if you want more go there right um and i think the scottish rite does a great great job of that i went through chapter and council in indiana so there's probably huge differences that i don't know about but those guys up there there were people there that could point me in the right direction too but if we're if we can't keep i mean i think that i am in the minority in that i joined an appendant body in my first year of masonry i think I'm, I'm a rarity there i would imagine that's not very common i was just about to leave so i wanted to get all, all of it done while i could um, in my last year of undergrad but uh if we can't even get people in the blue lodge to know like that there's something concrete and worth it out there you know, it's another set of dues. That's that's like the, the really practical fact of that is like, mm, you know, yeah. that's a hard sell when someone yeah. has just signed on. And it's not cheap. No. no. It adds up. I mean, up. it's worth it, but, but it's not cheap. It, it costs a lot more than your Blue Lodge costs. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I, I love Scottish Rite, but I just, you know, there's, there's such beauty in our three degrees, though, um, that I hate to see that loss. So that's mm -hmm. kind of why I was so adamant about, you know, working on this middle chamber thing that the education committee's done and, uh, you know, talk about the, those aspects of the Blue Lodge. But absolutely, you're right. If you really want to get into that, go to Scottish. But there's, I mean, but there is so much in the first three that never mm -hmm. gets covered. Mm -hmm. And I'm so, I was ecstatic when I found out about the middle chamber program. I, it was, the Grand Master came to Long Creek. It was like, I think one of the last lodges that he did on his year and when they announced that i mean i was i was elated because you know i had spent the past two years in a very great lodge in indiana but one in which these things weren't really gone into ever um and to find out that there was something sponsored by the grand lodge right and put forth i, w I was so happy because the scottish Rite has a master craftsman program right which yeah. when i was going back and forth that kept me really involved because it was something i could do at home but then i found out about you know that the blue lodge was doing that and man i was so happy because i was like finally you know um i think that is one of the the biggest steps towards what we're talking about of making this stuff visible that i've seen in any jurisdiction thus far i think it's great about the reading list in new yeah. york i'd like to get the list myself just to too. see it you know? <laughs> i think i've got a copy excellent send it to you excellent guys. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about middle chamber. I just, I feel like it's some it, the middle chamber sets everything up. You know, we always say that we're a progressive art, so that you got to learn. You know, the very first lessons before you can go on to the second lessons and the third lessons, because if not, you're you know you're building your house on sand, um, and and even to go straight to the Scottish Rite where they have the Master Craftsman program and. And uh, they, they talk a lot. It's a lot easier to talk about those aspects of, of the craft. Um, you've got to have that foundation from the Blue Lodge. That that, that Western mystery, basic, mm -hmm. um, you know, body, mind, and soul uh, teaching that those first three degrees give. And you've got to have a good understanding of that to go on to the, to the higher ideals of the Scottish Rite. Well, and I was talking to him beforehand. My entered apprentice degree changed me. Something happens oh, yeah. when you're initiated, right? That just the whole experience for me switch something on, right? Well, so, so tell me about it. When, well, when did it happen in the degree without being too specific? But well, and what and what was it that happened? 
I think well, a couple different things happened for me. One, I entered the lodge with a very loose, very loose conception of God because I entered as, as someone that identified as a Buddhist, right? Which isn't an atheistic religion, but it's a non-theistic religion, right? It right. doesn't really matter. So I could definitely meet the requirement of believing in a supreme being, but it wasn't one that, uh, you know, mattered in my life very much, right? So I wasn't disingenuous when I was, you know, being interviewed and all that stuff, but, you know, it wasn't a huge part. And uh, somewhere in that entered apprentice degree, because I had a late prompter, I found out that, you know, when I'm really put on the spot, I did have a belief in deity, right? Mm -hmm. And I did trust him. And uh, something about having a group of brothers come together and do that for me and do it well and, and just the entire thing and being, being brought to light, for me, that was a pivotal moment in my life. Um, it sparked a hunger in me and, and it awakened a part of my spirit that I didn't know was there. And because I had a lodge that cared about degree work, mm. that was one of the most important nights of my life, you know? And uh, boy, was I hungry for more after that <laughs> happened, you know? And so I think that, that that is an instance of how, you know, we can't, we shouldn't cast aside the blue lodge as being for, you know, average guys who don't want to learn the crazy stuff. Because for me, sure. that was, you know, huge. Yes. You want to yeah. follow up? Oh, it, I mean, I completely agree with that because for me, that was exactly what triggered me going back to school. Um, and I left New York. I moved back to Charlotte and ended up majoring in comparative religions. So for me, masonry was that exactly that. It was an igniting of some sort of empty spot within me that I didn't really realize was, that I had. And it just sort of ignited that spark. And I was like, man, I got to look into this. I got to learn more. I got to do this. And it was exactly like you said. It was that group of guys committing the time and the effort to put on this beautiful experience for me, this, you know, initiatic tradition that literally you know, and metaphorically brought me from darkness to light and just kind of threw me into this entirely new world and mindset mm -hmm. that I didn't know existed. I hungered for it. And I knew that I was wanting something, but I didn't know what it was until I actually experienced the first degree. And then it was, you know, being brought to light and really even just taking that first walk and, mm. you know, being put in that very vulnerable, mm. I mean, just inexplicable situation. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to be careful and kind of, yeah. you know, and how I word it, but. So. I'm glad that you guys had good experiences with your degrees, and you must have had pretty good degree teams that, that, that did it for you. Because I've seen some degrees that are not good. Um, but, you know, the, the just to be metaphysical for a minute, I've been to some degrees that are absolutely magical. And I, I'm always telling guys whenever I'm teaching a, you know, a lecture service or, or you know, talking about ritual and trying to get guys to know how to do it, that you uh, that your intention as the as the the team that's doing the ritual, and especially if you're the master, your intention uh, is is kind of everything, and that comes with an energy mm -hmm. um, that has a life of its own. And so, if you have no energy, if you're not concentrating on that candidate about this is all for him, this is all this is his experience, I the master, am going to transmit to you, the initiate, this, I'm trying to be careful myself here, but this, uh, you're initiating him into Freemasonry. You are giving him something. You're giving him um, the uh, all of the history and all of the teachings, and, you're, and, and, and all that comes later in the learning phase, but the idea that I'm making you one of us, and I'm doing that by, with my intention to bring you into what we are. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that as the master and the guys that are doing the degree, but especially the master, um, then the idea of initiation becomes what it is intended to be, uh, which is more than just giving a guy a used card. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a real knowing 
um, it's, it, it be can become the epiphany that it was for you guys, right? And, and when it's done poorly, that doesn't exactly come across. When it's done pretty well, it does come across. And when it's done with, re with the real intention and energy, then it, it is absolutely is magic. And, and I think that's a big key to, you know, even going back to what we were talking about, retaining membership. Because for those guys who really are seeking something further than just a, you know, a simple fraternal experience, it really is that focus of that intention and will and putting that out there in the physical and metaphysical space of the lodge that manifests that experience for the candidate. And I think yeah. going through that myself, that was the pivotal moment for me was really, you know, upon being brought to light and really actually getting to see and experience the lodge in all its glory in an open, you know, well done lodge is a totally different experience than just walking into a closed lodge, you know, to go clean it or something on the weekend. I mean. Yeah, I definitely think that the intention of the people doing the degree highly affects metaphysically what's going on with the candidate. Um, and I've read uh, an essay written by a guy from another tradition um, that, that deals with this exact thing is that, you know, if everyone there is basically projecting their will to make this one thing happen for this guy. Yes. Something magical occurs in that. But even on a more practical level, I think about when I give a lecture, right? And I know the lecture and I'm looking the guys in the eye and I'm highlighting things that are important in that lecture. Yes. Right. Maybe a wink and a smile on some words. That's a completely different experience for the candidate and whoever else in the lodge than if I do it verbatim, get every word right, yes. but read through it monotone, not making eye yeah. contact. Yes. When it seems scripted versus yes. from the heart. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Because I had a great lecture give mine. And, you know, there were times that he'd be like, hold on, I need to get a minute. But when he was talking, I'm like, how could this guy possibly remember this? Right. Because it wasn't like it was from a script. It was like he was giving me information. Right. And it was really well done. Yeah. If we can just, if we could just make everybody under understand that <laughs> only so you know so so being a certified lecturer and knowing a bunch of certified lecturers i mean you know there are guys that get all their words right yeah and then but there's a few magical guys that can put it all the whole package together they can do it with intention they're not nervous they know their words uh they're 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 actually having a conversation with a candidate and when when you hit those guys it, it is it is magical. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. So, boy, I would like to explore all those topics more. Maybe we'll do that next year. Maybe we'll do that next year. Absolutely. Hmm. Let's get by, get on with a few announcements. Any idea what time we started this, Brown? Not really. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to somehow have a timer on this thing. Because I've gotten a bad habit of not writing down what time we started. How long does it feel like? Uh, close to an hour. Yeah, I think so too. Let's bust through just a, a, a few quick little things. Hey, I went to uh, Ryan Flynn's lodge in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm proud to announce that I am now um, an honorary member of Ancient York Lodge number 89. Uh, so awesome. I'm, I'm now a Yankee Mason. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I uh, know. Really cool. Went up there. I opened for Oscar Allen. I was the open warm-up act. <laughs> but it uh, it was all good. Anyway, appreciate Ryan having us up there. I love that dude. He's um, he's. I talked to him again today, and he's supposed to have our design done, and he's supposed to be working on it more tonight, and he's supposed to have it to me tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see. He's going to – do you guys know Ryan Flynn? Mm -hmm. Masonic artist, he did a bunch of the drawings uh, next door. We were guys, nice. and he's he's going to design. We're fixing to remodel our lodge, and he's going to uh, do the art work. He's going to do the design for it, and it's going to be spectacular, really spectacular. It's not quite going to be Saint John three, uh, but it's going to be in the ballpark of that. I mean, it's going to be in that neighborhood. I think he's going to fly down here and do the art and and, and do the murals Excellent. on the wall. Anyway, well, we'll let you know uh, next month. Uh, we're going to have um, the Grand Master on. Uh, he wants to shoot the, the episode, at least this is what he told me, unless something's changed the last time I talked to him. Um, he wants to do the episode that will be coming out September 1st. Uh, wants to talk about some of the code amendments that are coming up in annual communication. 
And I thought that would be the episode to do it because it's the, the, the last episode prior to annual communication where all the voting is going to go on. Uh, he'll clear up any questions that we have on any of the code amendments and whatever else Grandmaster would like to talk about. Um, I'm hoping that sometime uh, before the end of the year, sometime maybe after that one, uh, that once we have uh, elected Right Worshipful Brother Speed Hallman uh, to be the next Grandmaster, they always hate it when we say this because they never want to jinx it, right? They never want to uh, presume that they're going to be elected, but I'm sure he's going to be elected. So uh, once we get him elected, hopefully we can get him on sometime in the next, uh, before the end of the year. Um, and I just want to say a few things about Davy Academy. Uh, it's undergoing some pretty wholesale changes. I went to a meeting uh, last Friday uh, with all of the all of the shakers and movers in Davy Academy, um, and we're kind of re totally revamping the whole system. It's the same basic principle uh, layout, uh, but a lot of the classes are changing. We're going to do more workshops. Uh, we're going to do less curriculum stuff. There's going to be a whole new schedule. And we're going to try and do a better job of projecting out uh, where the classes are going to be um, and, and what classes are going to be taught in what city. Uh, hopefully we're going to be having something out on that in the next month or two. All I can tell you is um, we, we've had a lot of uh, fits and starts uh, with Davey where uh, we've changed the schedule a couple times, we've changed the classes, and then we had um, information that didn't correspond necessarily. It was very confusing to, to our customers. Um, but hopefully we're going to get all that squared away. We talked about the fact that we have been not doing a good job uh, in that area, so you're going to see kind of a brand new Davy Academy going forward. It's uh, been very successful this year. Uh, we're excited about where we're, we're going with it. It's, uh, it's strong. People are coming. Uh, we just need to get our house in, in order. We ran that thing out pretty quick. It's a huge, huge undertaking, uh, and we're on the, the, the road to getting it right. Th two or three years from now, it's going to be, uh, 100 percent squared away we'll have all the the bugs worked out of it uh, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing for north carolina I and mean, we're going to get it fixed uh, keep checking back on the website the grand lodge website uh, masonic education uh, resources up in the right hand corner uh, and then click on uh, the davy academy and you'll find all the information and if you get confused uh, just send us an a, a email or a Facebook message or something here, and I'll see if I can unconfuse you. I seem to have been doing a lot of that here lately. All right. I think we're fixing to run out of here. What else you got, Riley? I see. I just That's like to thank these guys for coming down. It was uh, You and I have been talking about having younger guys on here quite a bit, and um, it's nice. I mean, it's, it's refreshing to hear both of your standpoints. So we really appreciate you guys coming tonight, making the journey down. Appreciate yeah, good you. You guys want to say anything? Uh, if I could, I got to shout out our 150th anniversary dinner. It's uh, October 21st, so Scottish Rite guys, sorry, it's literally the same evening that the reunion finishes. Oof. I think reunion's done about five dinners, about six o'clock. Uh, You'll never make it because you're well, going to be in Greensboro. Yeah, doors open at <laughs> six. Uh, you can find all the info Excelsior Lodge 261.org. Black tie dinner. Big fancy event to celebrate our birthday. We'll get you there as quick as we can. We'll get you out of Scottish right quick as we can. <laughs> Just thanks for having us. Having a good time. Yeah, we appreciate yeah, you guys Thank coming you guys. down here. Yes, sir. Had a great conversation. Good deal. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Let us out. Thank you for listening to this episode of Masonia. For more information and productions, please visit and like our Facebook page at 357productions or 357productions.com. You may also email us at 357productionsteam at gmail.com. Again, that is 357productionsteam at gmail.com. As always, tell people that you love them, and remember, we meet on the level and part of the square. <laughs>